Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service of praise and worship here at St. Mary's in Barrow. And a warm welcome to everybody here in person and those who are watching later uh, in the comfort of their own home. Before we start, let's just take a moment to center our thoughts and to still our hearts briefly while we remember where we, where we are. Lord God, we thank you for your presence with us and pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to us today that we would be aware of your presence, be aware of your love and we ask it for your glory and in Jesus' name, Amen. So if you're able, if you could stand and we will say the confession together. So we say together, Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, Deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds, and revive us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We receive the forgiveness of God. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life, in Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to remain standing, uh, you can sit because this next song is um, a video and so you might feel more comfortable sitting. Obviously, remind you that we're not allowed to sing while we're here, but so sing it in your head if you'd like to.
you'd like to be seated, and we'll now have our Bible reading, which I believe Julia is going to bring to us. Glasses won't get steamed up now. I'm reading this from the message. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting Christians. A meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master, firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dogdom. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could go and get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experiencing his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. This is the word of the Lord. Lord God, we thank you for your word to us and pray now that you would open our hearts, our minds to hear your spirit speaking to us today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, continuing with the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi Um, is actually generally thought to be one of his most positive and uplifting, even though he himself was actually in prison while he was writing it. There's some dispute maybe as to where he was in prison, but he was definitely in prison. He makes that clear in chapter one. And, um, And despite this, he uses the word joy or rejoice many, many times throughout the letter. In chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he says, 
In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, But even as I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So he's full of this joy that comes from knowing God. But having said that, this particular passage that we heard takes a slightly different tone. It's sort of in the, in the middle of, there's a whole load of joy at the beginning, a whole load of joy at the end. But in the middle, he gets quite serious. He takes a, this different tone because he, as he does in so many of his other letters to other churches, he is warning the church at Philippi. But this time, instead of warning the actual people of the church, as he does in some of the others, about their behavior, he's warning them about others who will try to infiltrate, trying to come in with a message that goes against the whole of the gospel message. In the verses just before the reading that we heard from Julia, um, Paul uses some really strong language, actually, to describe these people. He calls them dogs and mutilators of the flesh. And it seems that these people who are, again, coming from a Jewish background, are trying to teach um, the church at Philippi, who are a non-Jewish background of believers, because they, uh, Philippi was actually a, a, um, a Roman area that was a very much a city set up by the, um, some of the emperors of Rome as a sort of an outpost of theirs for old soldiers, people who had helped them in various campaigns, and they had set up this city for, for them. So it was very much coming from a Gentile background, and there were these Jewish infiltrators trying to tell the, the new believers that they had to be circumcised because that's what good Jews do. And Paul is saying that actually, I'm a good Jew, I am the best of the best as far as my claims to being a good Jew. Um, that he was circumcised himself on the eighth day as per Jewish law. He is of the people of Israel. He was a tribe of Benjamin, one of the sort of the, the, the 12 tribes. And he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, which basically means that he, not only was he a born a Hebrew, he spoke Hebrew, he lived up to all of their expectations. His attitude, his lifestyle display the Jewish background. And he goes on to talk more about this, really sort of setting out his credentials as to how he has this Jewish background. With regard to the law of Moses, he was a Pharisee. And as we probably remember from hearing the Pharisees dealing with Jesus, they were very much um, sticklers for the law. In fact, they added more laws on. They took the laws of Moses and added bits on, even down to things like um, giving a tenth, because there was a requirement for them to give a tenth. And Jesus, I seem to remember talking about, you even say that you should give a tenth of your cumin. Well, have you ever seen a cumin seed? They're tiny, aren't they? <laughs> So you give a tenth of your cumin. They were real sticklers for the law. And of course, he was himself a zealous persecutor of the early Christians because of his background. So he was saying that in regard to the law, his righteousness could not be faulted. So to beware of these dogs, these dogs that wanted to impose circumcision on these Gentile believers. But then Paul says, having set out all of these um, credentials about how Jewish he is, he then says, do you know what? I now consider all of that to be completely worthless. In verses seven and eight, he's talking about profit and loss and how he had previously seen all of these things that gave his Jewish background to be a great prophet, but actually now he considers to be a total loss, waste of time, 
He used to consider them important. They made him a righteous person in God's sight. But actually in comparison to knowing the risen Christ, they're rubbish. In fact, he uses even stronger language than that. Apparently the Greek word that he used for, for what we're sort of calling rubbish can even be used as dumb. So he was quite strong words. And he sees now, having met Jesus on the road to Damascus in the vision, he sees that righteousness comes from faith in Jesus and not from following the letter of the law, not from giving a tenth of his cumin, not from giving all of those things, not from being a Hebrew, not from being from the tribe of Benjamin. It's from knowing Christ as his saviour. His greatest desire now is to know Christ and his resurrection power. And it's such a desire that he's prepared to share in the sufferings that Christ has endured. And he expresses it, a need to just keep on pressing on, getting more and more sort of closer to God and more involved in what God wants him to do. In verses 13 and 14, he says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. In other words, this, this resurrection power, that he's, and yet he's displayed some of the resurrection power in some of the things he's done, some of the miracles he's performed in his previous, before he was in prison. But forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which as God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. He is so determined to carry on, even though he's in prison, even though his life is under threat. Now back in the spring and summer of this year, there were a group of us uh, from, from some areas who met as a virtual home group via a Zoom, um, actually to study the book of Philippians. And we used a video study by uh, a well-known theologian and author, uh, Bishop N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. Um, it was enlightening, it was challenging sometimes, and sometimes it kind of went over our heads a little bit because, he, because he's a theologian, he's, he really went into depth in some stuff. But I think we all learned something from that, um, and it was, it was actually really good. Um, in fact, so much so that we actually ended up calling it uh, Thursday's Fun with Philippians because we were having fun. It was really good, very, very good. But at, during that time, one of the discussion points was what Paul meant about this, forgetting what is behind. Because many of us felt that actually we need to remember things that have gone on in the past. Um, in order to learn from them, in order to, because we all say we learn from our mistakes, don't we? Sometimes that's true, not always, but anyway. Um, but we need to perhaps have a, a, a memory of what we've done in the past in order to learn from those and move on, which is what he was talking about, moving on. But we came to the conclusion that Paul doesn't mean it in the sense of losing a memory of, forgetting what anything that's, that's gone behind, gone before, it's a sense of um, just losing that, the weight, if you like, of his sinful past, forgetting what's happened to him, forgetting all of that stuff he had as, as claims for being a good Jew, but actually putting that behind him and moving on with Jesus. And that's what I think we're called to do as well. Um, we're able to press on to what is to come. And Paul is talking about the reward of everlasting life, of glory with God. And that can only come through faith in Christ. I was just to sort of illustrate what I think I mean by this, um, I used to do quite a lot of long distance running. Um, so it came to me sort of that this is a bit like running a marathon. When you take part in a race over such a long distance, you can easily get 
distracted, if you like, by how you've done so far. You can go one of two ways, probably. Um, well, I know because I've done it. Um, sometimes you'll be there and you're on a good day oh, and you're thinking, ah, those first 10 miles went well. If I keep this up, it'll be easy. Well, I can tell you that running a marathon is never easy. <laughs> or conversely, there have been times when those first 10 miles were really awful and I was thinking, do you know what? I think I might as well give up now and just walk home. But the reality of running a marathon is that you will go through good periods, you will go through bad periods. Even people like Paula Radcliffe did that. But it's important to keep on pressing on towards the finish line, as Paul describes it. And that's true in our everyday lives, not just in running a marathon, isn't it? We need to keep pressing on. We need to um, be aware that, yes, we'll have good times, we'll have bad times. I mean, it may be at the moment um, that you're going through a bit of a tough time. I mean, with all that's going on around us, that's not surprising. Some of us are struggling with health issues. Some of us are struggling with money issues. These things are all going on in our lives. Or you may be in a good place and everything's going well. Whichever applies to you, Paul encourages all of us to persevere. I find the words he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 9, a real encouragement. He says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Let's face it, we are fragile and frankly ordinary like a, jar, a clay jar. But with God's Holy Spirit at work in us, we can draw on God's love and his strength to get us through anything. But what does that mean? I mean, that's obviously really important to Paul and I think it should be important to us. So what does that mean for us today? Are there aspects of our lives that we may think point us to having made it as a Christian in the same way that Paul had all of those credentials to say that he'd made it as a good Jewish believer? Do we perhaps consider having grown up in a Christian family means we're automatically inheritors of our parents' or grandparents' faith? Do we think that serving the church for many years grants us some kind of special status? Or it may not even be to do with the church. It might be that our career has been so important to us or um, thinking of sort of modern day things, you know, how many followers we've got on Twitter or friends we've got on Facebook or whatever it might be. Are they the things that grant us or give us that sense of worth? Um, and Paul says that they shouldn't be. What gives us a sense of worth is knowing and being known as a disciple of Christ. I mean, none of those things, whether you've been brought up in a Christian family, whether you've served the church well for many years, none of those things are wrong, by the way. Don't, don't stop doing those things. Um, it's just that we, we shouldn't place our trust in those things. We need to be aware that our upbringing or our zealousness isn't going to make us any more righteous or any more special. Only our faith in the resurrected Jesus as Lord and Saviour can actually make us acceptable in his sight. So like Paul, when we recognise that, we can then press on towards the goal that is eternal salvation and glory. So just to conclude, I'd like to encourage you with the words that Paul wrote in the final verses of chapter 3, which we didn't hear read this morning, but they, they finish off his, this chapter. But our citizenship 
is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. We're now going to, well, I was, I was going to say we're now going to sing again, but we're not going to sing again. We're going to stand and read uh, the words of a song. And it's a beautiful song, I think, and really sums up uh, this passage that we've heard read. Um, All I once held dear, built my life upon. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and be known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, There is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Oh, to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings, to become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and never die. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Please be seated for our time of prayer. And after Marion has brought us into sessions, we will actually then be seeing a video of the Lord's Prayer, which is a sung version. So uh, remain sort of seated in a sort of attitude of prayer following that. Thank you. So let us pray. Holy God, you made our world And we, your people, seek to honour you as we carry out your work in Barrow and Breen. Help each one of us to reflect your light in the world as we seek your guidance in all we do. We give thanks for all those who have been called into ministry, who will follow your example and love and care for all. So we thank you for those ordained as deacons this last week and those as priests. We give thanks especially for Jo as she continues her ministry amongst us as a priest. May she always know and follow your example and be assured of your love which surrounds her and Sam who was ordained as deacon this week and we ask for your blessing upon them both. Lord, in your mercy, We bring before you the church throughout the world and we remember especially those who are persecuted because of their love for you. Be with them through their trials and give them courage, strength and peace even in the most difficult of situations. We give thanks for agencies such as Christian Aid, Save the Children and many others that seek to bring help, comfort 
education and health care to those who are suffering. Be with them, Lord. May they know they are held in your loving care and enable them to show by their care that you are their guide. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for your church here in this benefice for all who worship and are here this morning, and for all who will later watch online. May we be a church that holds fast to the example of Jesus and help us to build a community of trust and love in our area. We pray for our schools, for Barrow School and King Alfred's, which most of our local children attend. We give thanks for teachers and support staff who in difficult times are continuing to bring care and education to our children. Be with and bless all who work in our schools and all children in education as they are learning to come to terms with new ways of schooling and new ways of playing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your son Jesus will take away our fear if we put our trust in him. So we pray for those who are finding life difficult at this present time, for those who have lost or are fearful of losing their jobs because of the impact of the coronavirus, and those fearful of contracting the virus. Be with all who are unwell at this time, and in a moment of silence, we bring before you those known to us personally. We thank you, Lord, for all who offer care and support at this time and ask for your blessing on each one of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all who have died. May they rest in your peace. And for those who are grieving, we pray they may come to know your love and know they are held firmly in your arms. In a moment of silence, we bring to you those again that we know. Lord, in your mercy, Faithful God, as we move into the coming week, we pray that each of us will work and live to bring honour and glory to you as we proclaim your power and peace. Make us all worthy of your calling to serve you as we try to follow your example in all we do and say. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing together, Father in heaven. Father in heaven, only is your name Your kingdom come Your will be done on earth As it is in heaven Our Father in heaven Lead us not into temptation Yeah. 
We've come to our final hymn, 
which of you could stand and we could say together. Um, it's also our affirmation of faith and the offerings will be brought up during the course of this one. So we say together. We believe in God the Father, maker of the universe, and in Christ his Son, our Saviour, come to us by virgin birth. We believe he died to save us, bore our sins, was crucified. Then from death he rose victorious, ascended to the Father's side. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all. 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 Name above all names. Name above all names. We believe he sends his spirit on his church with gifts of power. God, his word of truth affirming, sends us to the nations now. He will come again in glory Judge the living and the dead. Every knee shall bow before him. Then must every tongue confess. Jesus, Lord of all, Lord of all. 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 Name above all names. Name above all names. If you'd like to yeah, remain standing, we'll, I thought it'd be quite nice to uh, pray the grace upon one another this morning. I know um, we can't share the peace and things like this these days, but I thought we could at least share the grace. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And hopefully there will come a couple of pictures coming up from Jo's ordination as she's had quite a, a month of um, exciting things happening to her. So there should be a couple of those. Are they there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.